Hey folks, thanks for checking out Reigniting Liberty. I'm Deneen Borelli and Dr. Tom Borelli is in the house bringing you the truth in black and white. And we also have a great guest joining us today. It's Adam Andrzejewski. He is the CEO and founder of OpenTheBooks.com, which is a nonprofit group that reports on spending by the federal, local, and state government. Oh my goodness, how dare you? How dare you? <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> it's great to be here, Deneen. Dr. Tom, thank you for your interest in our work. Well, Adam, I have to tell you, you know, once upon a time, I used to work for corporate America, and I used to give money to nonprofit groups on, on what the company uh, was focused on. And after leaving corporate America, both Denise and I worked for nonprofit groups. So we kind of know the nonprofit space. But I have to give you full credit because you and your organization are doing something very, very unique and very, very important by opening up the books that is opening up the numbers. And I don't think anybody else out there is doing that. Well, they're not. I mean, there really is, you know, the next arms race and we're well in it and, and maybe we've lost it, but we don't believe that is government is using the latest of, in technology to open all of us up. They've got all of our communications, all of our emails, you know, foreign adversaries are probably dialed into our system. They have that as well. So the private sector is fully transparent in the internet age. What's not transparent, so the system is completely upside down, is government. As you know, we, we get our rights from God and not government. We instituted a government to secure our rights. That means they work for us. They've forgotten about that. And so at OpenTheBooks.com, we level the playing field by simply bringing basic transparency to government. And often shell, oftentimes that comes with a bombshell, bombshell investigations. Yeah, I can't imagine they like you very much, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know, the system's upside down. Like I said, we're open and transparent in the private sector. Now the public sector, government, we got to catch up. At OpenTheBooks.com last year, we filed 50,000 Freedom of Information Act requests to capture not all, but virtually all government spending at every level. And we display it all on our website at OpenTheBooks.com for free for people so you can follow the money so you can hold the political class accountable for tax and spend decisions. I love it. Well, we want to do a deep dive into uh, what you found out in terms of your research with the National Institute of Health, the NIH. And let's start with, hmm, oh, I don't know, Dr. Fauci. Hey, let's start with him, who has this amazing salary, $400. $56,000. Oh, and 28. I don't want to leave that out too. $456,028. Oh my goodness. So why is Fauci the highest paid federal government employee and how did he get such a high figure salary? So look, we believe transparency revolutionizes United States public policy and politics. So let's start with the top paid federal bureaucrat, which is Tony Fauci. And Deneen, you know, we broke that in my then column at Forbes back in January of 2021, when Fauci out earned everybody. Who knew? The president, four star generals in the United States military and 4.3 million of his colleagues at the federal level. And last year, he made 456000 Well, he got a pay bump. He now makes over 480000 Last week, he gave a roadmap to his retirement. He says he's going to retire no later than January of 2025. And on this basis, our auditors at OpenTheBooks.com, we immediately crunched crunch the numbers to take a look at his starting pension payment in retirement. And incredibly, when he retires, he's going to receive a first year retirement pension payout of 414,000, which, which will exceed the president's salary at 400 grand. That's, that's just un, unbelievable. You know, Denise and I have often said that, you know, heaven on earth is being a government bureaucrat because you get paid well, you can't get fired, and you have great benefits and vacation. But Fauci is way, way on top of that hill. He's not only heaven on earth, he may be God on earth with respect to the bureaucracy. 
Well, he's definitely at the top of the heap. And to answer the question as to how and why he's the most highly paid, look, it's a, it's a great question. He's the director of a sub-agency of a sub-agency, the National Institutes of Health, of Health and Human Services. Yet he, he makes more than double the secretary of HHS, which is a cabinet-level position. So how? How did this happen? Great question. And we found a memo that sheds light on this. We had to sue for this memo. We found the Fauci family finances are buried deeper than the presidential safe place. We sued for, we found this memo from 2004 during the George W. Bush administration, which is the reason why he's the top paid federal bureaucrat, because it conferred on Tony Fauci a permanent pay adjustment, think a permanent bonus for his work on biodefense. A decision was made within the United States government that Tony Fauci was too valuable to let him jump to the private sector. So the, uh, they, they gave him this permanent pay adjustment, but that was private. It was publicly announced by virtue of George W. Bush when he conferred on Tony Fauci in 2008 the highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So Tony Fauci, you know, a decision was made and everybody knew it. Tony Fauci is untouchable. He's protected. He's unfireable. And we need him on the team. And I think it was a poor decision in, in hindsight. Well, all you need to do is look at the job description you just outlined. Bio-defense, right? And what did the man do? The man helped fund the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which was playing around with back coronaviruses, and in my view, is responsible for the pandemic. So in this bizarro, twisted world, the man who's the highest paid bureaucrat to stop bioweapons turned out to have a essentially a bioweapon because he helped create it with our taxpayer money. This is just clearly outrageous. Well, Dr. Tom, you're exactly right. So he was, in a nutshell, he was paid to stop the next pandemic, and he failed. Uh, why am I laughing? Big failure, yeah. This uh, the sentinel on the wall, right? right? So we were talking about his uh, annual salary, but the man also gets royalties. Now, can you break that down for us? How is that even possible? And and what are these royalties? So Tony Fauci is a pro probably a small part of the massive third party hidden royalty stream at NIH, and I want to break that down. Okay. So back in 2005, Fauci was a bigger part of that royalty stream, and it was unearthed with a Freedom of Information Act request by the Associated Press. They got the entire database of third-party paid royalties, think pharmaceutical companies, paying a royalty for an NIH and a scientist invention. Uh, and Fauci was, had received in a seven-year period $45,000 for the invention of an AIDS drug. So during that period, he's the director of his institute, and $36 million of taxpayer money goes to enhance the drug Tony Fauci created, and he's the director of the institute. Obviously, the buck stops with the director on funding. So even Fauci recognized this as a gross conflict of interest, and he said he'll, quote-unquote, donate his royalties to charity. The issue disappeared for 17 years until we noticed it in our auditor's file, the Freedom of Information Act request for the database. And so here's the update. During the pandemic, all of us felt that, and we got the sense that big government was very close to big pharma. And because of this database now and our federal lawsuit, so 10 months ago, we filed the Freedom of Information for the Dead Act. So we filed the Freedom of Information Act request for the database. NIH ignored it. We immediately sued them in federal court. Judicial Watch is our lawyers. And on February 1st, they admitted to holding 3,000 pages of line-by-line -line royalties subject to our lawsuit. And they were going to produce 300 pages a month on that lawsuit. Today, we've actually received 1,800 pages out of the 3,000. And so I can estimate now the entire complex of these hidden third-party paid royalties that are enriching NIH and up to 2,000 of its scientists. And here's the big number. It's $400 million 
over the course of the last decade. So think about this. Every year, NIH doles out $30 billion worth of grants to over 50,000 entities in healthcare that receive it. They basically buy the entire industry. Creates a lot of clout, a lot of friends. And now we know, coming back from the industry, to 2,000 of its scientists, including Fauci, Collins, the former head of NIH, other directors of institutes under the National Institutes of Health, so conflicts of interest with leadership, we now know it's $400 million over the course of the last decade of these royalties. Now, to complete the thought, that's what we can tell from the production, the top line numbers. Here's what we can't tell. The payer, think pharmaceutical company's name, is redacted and erased. The amount, the amount of the payment to the individual scientist, we can see their names. I know there's 2,000 scientists. The amount of the payment is blacked out and erased, and their invention, the license number, patent number, that's erased as well. So they are acting like they have a lot to hide on this database. Yeah, well, that's, that's incredible. That's the, that, that's the uh, following question. <laughs> what are they trying to hide? And as you mentioned, your opening, don't they know they work for us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all these inventions were within taxpayer-paid facilities, labs with taxpayer-paid gear, with the scientists paid by taxpayers. Okay, I, you know, we're going to be back in court trying to unredact the database. Five U.S. senators on the Homeland Security Committee, led by Rand Paul, have written an oversight letter asking for the unredacted database from NIH. And the deadline was back in June. They have NIH didn't even respond to the letter. They just ignored that as well. So there's a real accountability problem and transparency problem at the National Institutes of Health. There's also it, it an sounds, arrogance problem oh, as well. It, it, yeah, again, <laughs> it sounds so much like the FBI deep state, right? When uh, Representative Nunes was trying to get information from the FBI, he couldn't get it. And it seems like uh, NIH, you know, the scientists who were trying to come up with uh, cures uh, for the American citizen, it seems like they have their own version of the deep state. So I just want to give you a couple examples. Now, again, the universe of scientists, once we have the database, we're, you know, after legal wrangling, we're confident we're going to get the whole thing, like the Associated Press received 17 years ago. They got the whole thing, right? So, so here's just one. With the limited information we have today, here's just one of the examples that we've been able to tease out. You've got a scientist at NIH that, invent, that invents something, so he stands to receive royalties, so he leaves NIH, he founds his own for-profit business, and licenses back his own invention. So he's basically paying royalties to himself through his new for-profit entity. And then he's trying to monetize that, obviously, on a for his own invention that he invented on the taxpayer dime. He's now in the private sector, basically renting it from himself, leasing it from himself to monetize it. In, you know, for his for-profit business. That is just one example of what we're finding in terms of insider trading on NIH royalties. I, I don't even have the words to say. I mean, this it's just, it's incredible. What, uh, so I want to give you another example if you've yeah, got please time do. for it. Sure. Yeah. The, the number one recipient of payments. Again, we don't know who the number one recipient based on the amount of the payment is because they're knocking that out. But, but we can sell, tell how much each individual scientist, how many payments they received. So the number one scientist on payment count, his name is Robert Gallo. So he leaves the agency in 1996, and he founds three organizations. And this is actually pretty stunning. So, and again, he's the number one uh, third-party payment receiver on these royalties. So he founds underneath the University of Maryland, an institute. He founds a for-profit business, and he founds a non-for-profit, the Global Institute of Virology. Okay, let's back up. Into his, fir into his first two entities, through the University of Maryland, the institute, and his for-profit business, over the, over the course of the last 15 years, he soaked up over $600 million worth of federal grants, and most of those came out of the National Institutes of Health. While he's the number one receiver of royalties, but don't forget about the nonprofit, this Global Institute of Virology. 
Members of this include the FDA and the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So when the lab leak theory was first proposed, he's in the national press with the opinion editorial saying, hey, even if it escaped from the Wuhan lab, we want good relationships with China. And he's poo-pooing the whole theory, never disclosing that the Institute of Virology at Wuhan is a member of his own nonprofit public charity here in the United States. Wow. Tom, Tom, please. <laughs> you, I, he still quotes to Fauci. Fauci wrote an op-ed a couple of years ago saying if we ever get rid of Christopher Columbus Day, we should make it Robert Gallo Day. That's how <laughs> close they are. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's quite the inside network. I, you know, uh, I have a PhD in uh, biochemistry and molecular biology. So years ago, I was actually in the lab. And the whole NIH system, the way they gave grants, there's like a study committee, they review the grant request, and all these people all support each other. So it's kind of a circle reinforcement network. And now it looks like it's extended not only from grant money, but also now to for-profit making money. It's just such an inside game, and they hide behind the white coats. Just because you're working on medical research doesn't necessarily mean you are a uh, playing by the rules or you're not trying to game the system. So it really has been an, an insular uh, network. And so happy for your work beginning to expose this. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's the American taxpayer, surprisingly, is getting ripped off. Well, Dr. Tom, you raise a lot of good questions. You know, you have a lot of good insights into this. And, you know, we just keep laughing on our team. The deeper we dig into these third-party paid hidden royalty stream of $400 million, basically the same names keep coming up. Look, it's a... It's a planet of about 8 billion people. But when you look at NIH, the same six or seven names keep coming up. And I want to give you an example. Right now, the acting director of NIH, his name is Lawrence Tabak. You know, Francis Collins for years was the head of it. And he left to go to the Biden administration. So he's the acting science advisor to the president. He got a 50% pay hike. His salary at NIH was 203500 He's working in the Biden administration for 300 grand. I've never seen anything like it. All the way back on White House payrolls to 2009, the highest paid White House staffer was 239,000. But Collins is making $300,000 over there. Okay, to set that aside, who took his place, acting director of NIH is Lawrence Tabak. Who is he? He's the former de deputy ethics uh, bureaucrat at NIH. So when you look at Fauci's ethical and financial disclosures all the way back to 2015, guess who's signing off on them? Lawrence Tabak. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, and it is, again, such a close circle because we saw that when uh, the first news reports came out about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, Fauci hits the uh, emergency, hits his bat phone, and calls the top scientist because someone said, hey, the thing looks like it's engineered. Well, they shut that down pretty quickly. And I forget the scientist's names, but I think after they wrote a, a piece saying, no, no, it's, I don't think it leaked from the lab. It, it was of natural origin. I think these individuals got a big grant money payback. I mean, well, this, this is uh, no shortage of uh, pay for play. So when we're talking conflicts of interest with the Fauci's, he lives a conflict of interest at the breakfast table, at the office, and then around the dinner table. Because Mrs. Fauci, Christine Grady, she's the chief bioethicist at Fauci's employer, the National Institutes of Health. And so while Fauci's crafting America's healthcare response to the pandemic on a medical strategic basis, Mrs. Fauci, Christine Grady's over there backstopping all of it at the NIH, issuing uh, looking at and studying her words, millions of angles on the moral and ethical response to COVID-19, including mandatory vaccinations, mandatory masking, uh, issues surrounding rendezivir, health care rationing. So we're working to open all of this up. And we just sued in federal court, again, with Judicial Watch, 
because NIH wouldn't even respond to our FOIA. So I want to know if she's got a nepotism waiver in her employment file. You know, this is just stunning on so many levels. And, and one thing I just thought of that I wanted to ask you about, uh, any idea where Peter Daszak is these days? <laughs> so that's at openthebooks.com. We basically break national news. So, you know, that wasn't our report on DASIC and the, and the funding through Echo Health Alliance. We didn't, we didn't break that in the national media. And so I don't have... Uh, I haven't followed the money, and our auditors haven't followed the money from that standpoint. Okay. No yeah, problem. well, you know, speaking of that topic, uh, what I found, well, it's also stunning, is, you know, you mentioned in your Substack article, and you refer to it today, something like uh, $30 million in research grant money and 56,000 56, recipients of that grant money. I mean, 56,000 people getting grant money. Uh, that's enough to fill Yankee Stadium. In fact, overfill Yankee Stadium because the capacity there is, I think, is 54,000. Wow. Any capacity. So with DASEC and all these other people, how in God's name can you monitor what they're doing with all this money? There's well, no in way. Con in Congress, they don't do oversight anymore. They've abrogated their role to give the federal executive agencies oversight. And, you know, people like Tony Fauci you know, continue to mislead Congress. You remember in January, the hearing with Fauci in the hot seat and U.S. Senator Roger Marshall from Kansas questioning Fauci for five minutes on his finances. He blew up the check in the background with his annual earnings as the top paid bureaucrat and questioned him. And Fauci lost, and Marshall cited Forbes, which was my column at Forbes. I'd been fighting for a year at that time to open up the Fauci financials. Uh, and Fauci melts down on national television and calls the U.S. Senator a moron. And before he did that, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. My finances are public knowledge. And it wasn't true. We've been suing for a year to break that stuff open. Yeah, he, wow. uh, he, he's pretty slippery. So you mentioned uh, Dr. Rand Paul, Senator uh, Rand Paul, as being uh, trying to key in on uh, NIH and, and the funds and how it's working. Um, are there any Democrats who have any interest in this? We haven't heard from any, unfortunately. And this should not be a partisan Correct. issue. This, this, this is yeah. not a, a political issue. Uh, this is a uh, good government issue of where is the tax money going and how is it being used? And your words is, are there conflicts of interest where people are enriching themselves? That used to be a Democrat concern as well. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because we want good government, Democrat transparency allies. As a matter of fact, at OpenTheBooks.com, every year we publish at least four oversight reports on federal data. And our former honorary chairman was the legendary U.S. Senator from Oklahoma, Dr. Tom Coburn. Yes. And our work is made possible because of Coburn's partnership with then Illinois Senator Barack Obama. And so we quote Coburn on every report. We also quote Obama on every report. And I just happen to have one right here. Here's Obama's quote. I know that restoring transparency is not only the surest way to achieve results, but also to earn back the trust in government. And that's the problem right now. People do not trust government. The only way back is transparency. NIH needs to come clean with the American people. They need to open the books. And not only do we not have faith in our government or government bureaucracies, because of Biden and team, we've lost faith in science. They can't even correctly communicate about science and vaccines and masks. They, they throw everything into, you know, one size fits all. And it has created such a backlash from the American people. I, they have done tremendous brand damage to medical science. And Fauci is actually part of the leader of that pack as well. So let's take a look at the three central questions regarding Tony Fauci. And look, Tom, I, I think America's ready for a serious and substantial debate on all three of these points. Number one, 
uh, did, you know, Fauci was paid to stop the next pandemic from his work on, on biodefense. Open the books on it. Let's see. You know, he denied funding gain of function where you soup up the lab virus, create the pandemic in the lab, and then you cure your pandemic in the lab, right? That was the goal of it. Highly risky, highly dangerous, especially when you're dealing with bad actors in this world. Okay, that's number one. Open those books. Number two, did, did the firemen, you know, were they, did they become the arsonists based on that work, right? Number three, was the cure promulgated by Fauci on the pandemic, was the cure, the prescription, was it worse than the disease? And we're, we're ready for a serious and substantial debate on all three of those points. No, it, it, and you know, the other aspect is when Fauci is doling out so much money, I refer jokingly, he's God on earth, but to pe if you're a, a, a researcher and you depend on Fauci for grant money, in reality he is. You wouldn't dare challenge the man because you're not going to get any grant money. Fauci said, and it's the big headline, and you remember it. Everybody watching the program remembers this. Quote, I am the science. And he really <laughs> believes that. Because you are the $30 billion. You do become the science. And that's what NIH doles out. Now, now Fauci doles out, I think, about $6 billion of that a year through his institute. But he has influence on what the entire NIH is doing, of course. So if the uh, Republicans take over the House, or what are the chances of them getting to the bottom of all of this that's going on at NIH? So I, I you know, they obviously have investigative power, and I think they're going to use it to try to get answers for the American people. So we're, we're working real hard right now to codify the public record. We just received six months worth of calendar entries on Dr. Fauci ahead of the pandemic. We had to sue for that with Judicial Watch. You know, I, I want the heads of NIH to be hauled in front of Congress simply on the issue of transparency. They will not even acknowledge our freedom of information requests any longer. They're using it, a strategy of using expensive taxpayer paid litigation to slow walk, forestall, and force us to sue them in federal court, expensive taxpayer paid litigation on a strategy to keep the United States taxpayer in the dark. And they need to answer for all of this. No, we're with you on that one. Uh, is there anything that we have not covered that uh, you want to mention to the viewers and listeners? Yes. So NIH um, according to our federal lawsuit, has admitted their past due on over 633 FOIA requests. They've underfunded on purpose the production department on sunshine requests. Meanwhile, we know from our data captured at openthebooks.com on the federal payroll, they employ 86 public relations officers. So they've overfunded their media operation. And look, Fauci's doing all the media. What are these 86 PR officers doing that soak up $15 million a year of paid perks and pension benefits. Wow. What are they doing? Get them over to FOIA and start producing documents. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a headline in itself. The number of public relations people at a research institute. <laughs> Can you believe well, this? No, cannot. That's why transparency changes everything. Yes, it does. So, Adam, uh, any social media platforms? I know we know it's openthebooks.com. Any other uh, platforms you want to mention? Yeah. So, in, uh, on Facebook, we're over a half million followers. On Instagram, we're starting, and Twitter, we're starting to pull those numbers up. We just crossed 10,000 on each platform. If you come to our website, key your email address, then you're on our breaking news list. So, you get all of our investigations on Fauci, NIH, and all the rest of them. We're going to have a huge. Huge month here in August. I can tell you, we've got some investigations coming down the pike. When I get nervous, that's when I know we've got some great investigations. Well, please come back because we want to know and we want our listeners and viewers to know as well because this is beyond eye-opening and startling. And thank you for all of the hard work uh, that you and your organization are doing. Thank you, Deneen.
Folks, it's Adam Angievsky, and I get an A for pronouncing your name correctly. Woo-woo! <laughs> thanks for joining us, Adam. We appreciate it. Great discussion, some serious stuff. Folks, thanks for checking out Reigniting Liberty. And remember, everyone has a role to play. What are you doing for liberty? Until next time.